We have on the phone with us from New York City, Mr. Abe Klein. I believe you're in Borough Park or Flatfish, Mr. Klein? Borough Park. Borough Park. Who recently had a tragedy in the family, and this is obviously a very highly sensitive issue, and he's very courageous, and I believe doing a great public service and talking to us about it. Um, he lost his daughter in tragic circumstances, and welcome, Mr. Klein. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your daughter, Malky, and, you know, her life and what happened? Share with us. Um, Malky was a sweet neshama. Um, it's a little bit, you know, in hindsight, it's a little bit more difficult to talk because I mix up uh, past, present, and future um, due to having being more knowledgeable today, but she grew up, um, she was, she's our number four in the family of five, and uh, she went to Besyakov, the same place as her sister went, her sister went, the older sister, and um, as young as in, I'm going to, I think it was age four, one of the teachers, uh, pointed out that we should take her maybe for evaluation. I'm assuming they saw something something off to the little degree. And uh, we told they told us to take her to an evaluation to the Board of Ed. And we did that. And the Board of Ed, um, they basically said, oh, she's going to grow up to be a running for public office one day. Um, but they approved her for what's called P3, which is, um, I guess, some additional funding for the school so they can add, like, one-on-one -on -one services, et cetera. Well, I think they call it resource room. That was at a very young age, and everything was fine. At least that's what we thought. Um, when she was a little older, we had to do that again because they approve it, I think, only till age five or six easily. And at that time, I had to write a letter and because from the school's perspective, from our perspective, she needed a little extra help, a little extra push. So they provide resource one-on-one. One -on -one. In addition to all that, um, throughout the years, we always help provide her with tutoring, etc. All throughout this time, she was really what seemed like happy-go-lucky. She had a million friends, that, so we thought. Um, she went to friends' homes. She had tons of friends come to our home. As a matter of fact, we have a, a phone system in the house that is four lines. And there were times where every single, it was Malky line one, Malky line two, Malky line three. It was like everything for her. And it seemed to be like everything is great. She wasn't performing as well as her older siblings. But we were not that concerned because it, to us it wasn't all about academics. Uh, if she's happy and uh, so she doesn't know it that well and if with extra help she can actually do better, um, it's fine. She'll be able to grow up to be a Yiddish mama raising a nice Yiddish family and so she won't become an accountant, she won't become a lawyer, and that's just fine. That wasn't the way the way we looked at things throughout um, her years. She was pulled out of class many times, you know, uh, quite a bit, to have uh, smaller groups where the school tried to help out. And um, so she actually got a lot of extra help. Uh, it happens to be that when she was in, I think she was six or seven years old, um, she was in the beginning of second grade. One Friday night when she was sitting at the Shabbos table, um, all of a sudden she just like blurted out saying, uh, my teacher says that I belong in first grade. My wife and I looked at each other in a way really not knowing what how to respond. Uh, Master Shabbos, my wife, called the teacher and asked her, how dare you? That's, but that was the extent to what we did. And 
from our point of view, we were hoping at least that this comment went over her head. We did not know that 15 years later she'll still be talking about that comment. How, she was in second grade at the time. That was the beginning of second grade. And the teacher said well, you belong in first grade. And she said it in front of the whole class. As time went on, again, she seemed very happy. Um, schoolwork was not her focus, but friends was her focus. Um, friends, fun, etc. And to us, you know, that was fine. You know, it, it was okay. Um, of course, if we would compare, and we didn't really compare as parents, um, <clears throat> I guess some might have called us more progressive. Um, but we didn't really compare. It was okay. If we, but if comparing to our older siblings, this was something that was very, very far away from the other ones. My All my kids, as in Malki's words, were are overachievers, and she considered herself an underachiever. That's the way she looked at it. It's true. About my, my all my kids are amazing, and so was Malki. But she was amazing in her own way, and not necessarily, if not necessarily being measured by academics. Eventually. As she grew older, and at age 14, she grew out of that particular system, and she needed to get into a high school. She had a very difficult time to get into a high school. Her re- report cards, which is a prerequisite you know, to for the next school, did not say much. Um, and she had a hard time even getting an entrance exam or interview, whatever they called it at that time. And finally, she was accepted to a school, very special person that was a principal of that school. That principal knew our older daughter. I think she was her teacher or, or her principal at an earlier time in Bisyakov. Accepted her into that school. It was a relatively new school. And I'm gonna and she was registered way way in advance, uh, you know, before the summer. The uh, initial tuition paid, deposit, whatever they call it. And she went off to camp. We knew that she has a school and everything is great. And and said she has a high school. As a matter of fact, she had a high she has a high school in a place where a very special person is a principal. And hopefully, you know, with uh, Hashem's help, she'll do very well. Um, it happened to be in eighth grade. Moving back the clock a little, she had a teacher that took great, great, beyond, great interest in her and really showed her that she believes in her. And they became very, very close. And she did extremely well in eighth grade in a relative basis, but extremely well um, compared to earlier years. Um, And she one day got up in the middle of a class. She stood up and she said, I am a new person. I am going to perform. I am going to be somebody different than than whatever you know about me in the past. You know, she made like a whole announcement in class. It was cute. So she end, so as she was accepted towards the end of the winter into that school, into that school and um, into that high school. I'm assuming. I'm going to make an assumption, maybe a wild assumption, that they didn't have that many registrants at that time. But coming to the end of the summer, all of a sudden we got a notice, or in, in the mail, I think it was actually, and, and w- I think it was with a check, if I if I remember correctly, or I'm not sure, or, or maybe they said it was with a check. Um, but we got a notice saying that she's unaccepted. And I was actually out of town. I was overseas on business at that time. And my wife went over and tried to talk. And, you know, then nobody really was responding. She went to the principal's home. I told her, go there 6 6 a.m. and try to catch her. Make sure that you're standing in front of the door. So if she ever needs to leave the house, she'll have no choice but to walk right into you. Um, I I landed on a Friday morning from overseas 
and I, the first place I went from the airport directly to the school, again, to do the same thing. The school, I think it was the first day or maybe a day before. I don't remember exactly. And I was trying to, again, talk. I said, it's the first day of school or day two before the first day, and you can't do this. This kid has no school. And nobody was talking to me. It fell on deaf ears. So she ended up without a school. That eighth grade teacher very what much got into... The very special person who took her in, where were they? That very special person could not face us. Uh, I, I'll, I'll get to that. You'll, I think you'll, 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 you'll get to, the, uh, you'll understand. Um, she didn't. That very special person did not come to face us, and that was very disturbing at the time. But it was a lack of understanding a little bit from our side, a lot from our side. We just couldn't understand what's happening. Her eighth grade teacher got right into working and trying to make sure that she gets a school, finds a school, because that teacher really believed in her. And um, within a week or two, I, you know, my the, the timeline's a little off, a little uh, foggy at this moment. Um, just before Rosh Hashanah, um, she. Baruch Hashem was accepted in a school. Again, it was a relative new school. I don't know if it was the first year or the second year they were operational. Um, and so when she had a school, she couldn't go right before Rosh Hashanah because she didn't have a uniform yet or whatever. It took a day or two to put this whole thing together. And um, she started school two, three days later. And she was excited. She has a school. She's a kid like everybody else. And um, we went and we bought her a new briefcase with her initials uh, engraved in it, which we ordered because, you know, new year, new school, new place, new briefcase. You know, you, all we want to do is lift her up and make her happy. And um, that briefcase ended up arriving Chalamait during the um, Sukkot because I ordered online. Um she went to school, and of course, her uh, limited abilities and on a scholastic level obviously was there. We told the school right in the beginning that she struggles with learning. We didn't have a diagnosis yet. Um, we were never advised to actually go and make a real evaluation besides the at age four, where it would have helped, it would have helped the school with a P3 program to help her out, um, but never to a real uh, a real doctor or, or whatever you call them um, to do an evaluation. So we didn't necessarily have a diagnosis. We just saw like what most people see, maybe calling it lazy, maybe calling it not interested, disinterested, whatever we see as uneducated people um, in, that, in that field. Once she was in that school, um, she did, I guess, the best that she could, which was not much because high school was already a little bit on a different level or much different level. She didn't have any extra help. The school didn't really have it. Um, and um, right after Sukkot, we were called uh, and we were told that she can no longer, oh, just a couple of days, I mean, three or four days after Sukkot, that they cannot hold on to her anymore. And we asked why. And they start giving us a lot of stussum first. Um, she comes every day with a new briefcase. I was explaining that she doesn't come every day with a new briefcase. She had one briefcase from last year, and because she came into she's coming to a special school, I mean a new school, we wanted to make her feel good, so we bought her a fresh new briefcase for the new school, and it arrived during Kalamoy. That's why you saw her with one briefcase before, and now you're seeing her with a second one. Uh... She's bring, then they said, she brings expensive nash to school. And I said, what's expensive nash? They said, oh, sow belts. We don't believe in these kind of things. I said, okay, so we'll talk to her about it. She won't bring sow belts. So will bring potato chips. Uh, that's fine. Oh, she breaks the school rules. She says, what are those? And she says, well, you know, the kids go out lunchtime to buy food because they didn't have a kitchen. So it was very small but we don't allow for the kids to eat in the pizza shop, but only to buy the pizza shop. They have to bring it here and eat here. And she did eat it in the pizza shop. I said, okay, that's not a death sentence. I understand. Rules are rules. 
and we'll talk to her about it. So she might not be that much aware of it. And then said, oh, she buys expensive gifts for kids. I said, what's that? She brought earrings for a kid in the class that is going, has had a birthday. And I said, I know about those earrings. It was $20. Um, I said, yeah, but, you know, we don't believe in that. I said, okay, I hear, but we let's understand a little bit where the child is coming from. She had a school. She didn't have a school. She's in a new school. A bunch of kids that she really doesn't know. And maybe she likes that kid, and maybe she's trying to buy a friend. It's not the end of the world. Again, it's not a death sentence. Um, ultimately, they said that the truth of the matter is that she is not following along. She sits all day in the class, and she looks out the window. Uh, she's clutching, you know, and uh, a kid can't survive like this in the class. And I said, that's true. I agree. So why don't I offer you... Let's build a whole resource room, especially for her, on my tab. Whatever you got to do, do. I'll pay for it. Just because she needs to have a school, she needs to be someplace, and let's help her out so she can um, perform as best as she possibly can. The the response was, um, how is she going to feel being out of the class half a day? I told them a whole lot better than being in the streets all day. That's the one thing I do know. I don't know how bad she's going to feel out of the class half a day. They said they can't. They really can't. They can't. They don't feel they have the tools. They just don't feel that they're set up. And I said, you know what? I respect you for it. I really do. And I cannot force you to redo your whole school for her. So I'll let me go out. I'm going to try to find the proper school for her. But I I, I need to find a school first before we can, be, be, before she's released from this place. Um, it, I'm going to go home. I'm going to start working on it right away. I'll reach out to people to try to find another alternative place for her. The, it was, the argument went a little back and forth. I'm not going to say it was an argument. It was more of a civil discussion. Um, we can't. We don't think it's good. We don't think it's right. And I said, do me a favor. Do me a favor. I'm going to work on it. I promise you right away I'll work on it. But do not send they're away before we have a school. When we left, my wife and I left, we ended up doing some errands and stuff. By the time we came home, my daughter was already home. As a matter of fact, she was, all her books were thrown around the, uh, the, the, the den. She was on the floor and we thought that she is dead because there was no movement. We didn't know what's going on. I went, o- I went over to check if she has a pulse. And I found her that she's sleeping on the floor in the den. Um, I'm assuming she cried. I don't know what, what happened. She cried to a point where, where she just fell asleep to a deep sleep. That night... Was, does um, that mean they, they told her they're throwing her out? Is that it? They threw her out. They threw her out right there and then. That was the end. She called... My, our daughter called this principal that night and... We happened to be, we overheard part of the conversation um, because we heard her talk in the room. She was crying and begging and I'm gonna, saying, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, I, I, I got, you're going to see, I'm going to do, I'm going to try. It didn't go very far. The, the next day, we someone told us to go to Mask and talk to Rahama Klapman. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Yeah, she's been on the program. Yeah. And we went to Mask. And we, my wife and I, just to see how they can help. I had no clue. I never heard of Mask in the past. Um, that maybe they can help. So we went to Mask and we told her the whole story, basically whatever we, just, whatever I just said, maybe in more detail. And I remember she picked up the phone and she actually called that principal and she, and she said to that principal, "I just want you to know that if you don't do something about this." You will have blood on your hands. She then made a phone call to someone else. She was starting to tell that other person something that we got to find a school, we got to this, we have a child at risk. And my, my wife and I were looking at each other. We had no clue what this woman is talking about. We thought that something was wrong with her. What do you mean a child at risk? So she doesn't learn that much. She's cute. She's sweet. She's everything. 
She does. And one of the things every time my wife went to to PTA, uh, you know, throughout the years, and the teachers were saying she doesn't uh, follow along so well. Yes, the help, the, the extra help helps, and all that. But in class itself, she has a very hard time following along. But they always said, but one thing, she never disturbs in class, never. And my wife always came home being happy, saying, you know, she's so good. Whatever, how bored she is, she doesn't disturb. And she behaved. She was very well behaved. Um, so we just completely didn't understand what Rahama was talking about. Uh, eventually, I think the next day, maybe, I think my daughter met the principal in a pizza shop or something because she said she was trying to talk to her and make make it good. That that's, it, it, because Rukhama told her, you must talk to the girls and do something. Anyway, they, sp- they spoke. I don't know what they spoke, but nothing happened, came out of that. And for three months, basically, she was in the, not in the streets. I mean, she was home, had no school. She kept on wearing that school uniform because she was so embarrassed that anybody... And she liked fashion. A school uniform was not her first choice of dress. Um, but she walked around with a uniform. She walked around with the school uniform more than when she was in school because she needed to make a statement that she has a school. It's only then that one of the people that tried to help us out it was um, one of us gone. I mean, a lot of people were trying to figure it out. One of them said, take you for an evaluation and they suggested a a doctor in Queens. Um, so we did. We asked our daughter if she wants to go for evaluation, and she says, e- anything that's going to help me get into a school, you know, which 14-year-old submits herself to evaluations. It's like, you're calling me stupid or what? But she did. She went. A few days later, we got basically a, a horrific report, a terrific diagnosis. That was the first time that anybody really said go, and they gave us a place to go. I mean, it was a, the whole thing of doing, taking our child's evaluation wasn't, didn't even dawn on us because our kids do well, and they really did. All of them did well. They were all top of the class. Um, she behaved well. She seemed happy, so she doesn't learn that much. What, we're going to evaluate her? Um, so we took her for evaluation, a few thousand dollars, and a few days later, we got that report. And now we had finally a diagnosis. So now came, um, now we started looking for a school that would actually fit her. And one of the, we looked around, I don't remember the the the, the, the time frame, the timelines, the, the, the chronological orders of things. But one of the places that was suggested, and I think, uh, what is it, Mandel from Ohel? Was it? Is Ohel Mandel? Yeah, that's Mandel, David Mandel. Yeah, and I think he was the one at that time was he was suggesting Queen Central, and he because he thought that they would have the right tools for. I think I sent him in the evaluation, and and we never showed our daughter the evaluation because we thought that she shouldn't be seeing it. He was suggesting Queen Central, and he was asking, he says, what are you, Hasidish? You're, where do you belong? And we, uh, and we told him, yeah, we are um, Hasidish, um, Spinka, Krula. Um, and uh, so he was telling me that, you know, it, I think it's a wonderful place. The question is if you don't have a, a Shkafa issue with, you know, if she's going to go to that type of school. And... Uh, you know, as much as I maybe, you know, I ask, what, what is it? They said, you know, your daughter might not be wearing skirts that long and things like that. And, you know, he's trying to give me a little explanation because I didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, listen, it's not what I prefer, but if that's what's good for her, then that's how it should be. Um, so we approached our daughter asking her, telling her about Queen's uh, Central and we told her where it is and all that, and we she did the maths, you know, with with us and what is it going to take to get to school every day. It ended up that she would have to wake up 6 a.m. in order to get to school timely, and she said, "There's no way in the world I'm go- I'm going to wake up 6 o'clock in the morning to go to a school, to a school. I'm not waking up 6 o'clock in the morning." Um, I remember that I was to a at least to some degree, I was actually happy with that response because now I won't have an escuffle problem. I didn't quite realize that 
a year later, I would not have an Ashkafa problem. I would the, the, everything would be very different. I was misinformed. I mean, miss uh, I, I, personally misinformed. I didn't have the right knowledge, um, and also she didn't want. And uh, school was a very difficult place for her to be. I didn't totally understand it at that time. Today I know more. Um, so she ended up not going there, and eventually there was a that there was a school that opened up mid year, and that wonderful person that I said I couldn't get hold of her when you know when they unaccepted her, that person made a, a school. She left that original school, and um, and she made a new school of her own. One of the reasons she made that new school and left the old school is because of these type of things. She felt that she sees way too much blood and tears going on, and she can't work within that organization. And she worked, and she made her own school. It happens to be that during this period of time, these three months that she was out of school, we were looking to give this girl some, uh, spend time with her, spend, you know, give her some sense of activities. Uh, we did all different kinds of things. One of them was that someone suggested that this lady from Israel, uh, I don't know how you would call something like that, except, I guess the female equi- equivalent to a chacham. I think she's a grand do- great-granddaughter from the, the Ben Ishchai. And so we took her there. You know, I'm not a person that really goes for these things normally, but might as well we give her some kosher entertainment, so to speak. So we took her, and uh, she was here in America, and um, it was interesting. We all went together, and she, my daughter wanted to go because, again, she was looking for things to do. And when we went in, and um, she asks my daughter, how is school? That was the first question. And my daughter responded, great. And then she asks my daughter and us, and she permission if she can possibly talk alone to her without us. And my daughter agreed, and we left. And the first thing that she asked my daughter right afterwards, she says, you don't have a school, do you? Who, Which who was, was quite this? interesting. Leora. That's her name? That's her name, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, you don't have a school, do you? And then, see, all of a sudden, my, my daughter started talking to her, explaining her ills and all that. Anyway, this lady, she writes Tillam prescriptions. She opens up the Tillam at random places. I'm not sure exactly what. And she writes down a couple of things. You know, you say this, this, this every day, blah, blah, blah. You know, she gives you some capitalist or whatever. I don't know exactly how that works. And she told her, say this for 40 days, and I promise you you'll have a school. For the, the, the Every day she said this to Helen with such kavana. Sometimes she kept on, you know, she was late at night, and she said, oh, ta, I didn't say my tell him yesterday. And said, but you can't say tell him at night. I said, no, 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 no. What Leora says that you can, you have to say this within every 24-hour cycle, night or day, doesn't matter. So on the 40th day, she came to me. And she said, ah, today's the 40th day. I've been doing this. I still don't have a school. Must have been so painful, now. <laughs> I, I broke down. And I started really worrying. I said, what a stupid idea. Why t- Now I'm going to break her whole... Now she, somebody told her, say, tell him, and everything would be okay. And now she's not going to believe in that either. And that's what I was thinking. That's the first thing that came to my mind, right? And I said, oh, I, you never believed in this? Why are you taking me? <laughs> why, why did you tell your child to do that? Anyway... I, I, my response after I asked, my response was after a moment of of, of uh, pause was, Malki, today is the 40th day. You finish your term. You did yours. Now let Hashem work. You will see. A few, day, a few days later, we get a phone. Uh, we get a phone call. So someone says the school fell apart. That original school. And 
there, it was a friend, my wife's friend, and a um, friend of the family, actually. And um, so she's very busy, back and forth, they're doing meetings, um, because there's a new school being opened, and students going here, students going there, whatever. There's a, whole, a lot of politics. So she basically, that was the call, because she, somehow my wife called her, and she didn't call back, so she came call to explain why she, um, w- you know, why she wasn't returning my wife's call. Like a day or two later, someone called up and, and said that that, te- that, the, that teacher, I mean, sorry, that principal, which I said before, that wonderful woman, he said that the first thing that came out of this woman's mouth when this whole thing fell apart, that now I will be able to help Malky Clive. And they called us because they heard that. So we got, and, I said, and then I said, can you do me a favor? Can you tell me which day? This whole thing fell apart. It was the 40th day. I I went to Malga that time. And I told her that this is what happens when you sat still in 40 days. The school fell apart. That wonderful lady now is making her own school. And the first thing that came out of her mouth was that now I will be able to help and um, so I think you will have a school now. She went for an interview, and she went to that school, and she was there for the rest of the year. It was about Hanukkah time. She did very well, but she worked very, very hard. She, 24 hours a day, literally, Besides sleeping itself, sleeping itself, 24 hours a day, she was busy with school. It was school and homework. You never saw her without having school paperwork in her hands. She came home from school. She didn't even eat dinner at home. She grabbed her dinner. She made herself a schedule every single day, about two or three or four tutors every single day. She set up her own schedule in the tutors. She came home. She grabbed the supper. She went to the first one. She ate it there during study, and then she went from there to another, from there to another, and that's what she did. And by the end of the year, by the end of the season, she actually passed two regions with a lot of help, and she had a reader, and she had all the help, but she passed two regions. And we as parents, we had tremendous nachas. We saw a girl coming together to a degree, you know, as misguided as it would have been. We saw a girl finally taking herself into her end. And um, we said, wow, finally got to a turning point in her life. Came the end of the year. She went to camp. And when she came back, before going to camp, she says, really, you know, that school didn't want me originally, and I know she did it, and I know she said, and I know this, and she wasn't 100% happy. She was respectful. He said, and and um, it was bothered her very much that she never ended up going to a school of her choice. And now it's, now the, the the choice is already not the second choice, not that it's already a third choice. And she made calculations. Oh, now they want me. They need girls, you know. But whatever the case was, you know, she was broken at that time to a degree. Not that we knew everything and saw everything. Um, but um, she went to camp. Things were happy. I think she went to Camp Aguda at that time. And she came. And when she came back, she said, I really would like to go. I, you know, that's not the, the school I wanted to go or now I want to go. They never they didn't want to accept me to begin with. And um, she just had it was things about it were about it were irking her and it was hard to understand she went to schools by herself she actually went to school she wrote herself a note um she wrote herself a, a actually talking point when she went to a principal talking about trying to get into a school into their school um i don't have the note in front of me um but um, it was it's heart wrenching to read that note. I only found it later on because I, I um, that note I didn't see it right away. What did the note that, say? She, it reads as follows: 
Please hear me out. Before telling me no for the best reasons you may have, please at least give me a chance. It doesn't matter who somebody may have been. It matters who they want to be. And who do I want to be is the best that I can be. I want to grow and change and work harder. I want to see what I'm capable of because I bet it's a lot. Most importantly, I want to go to, and she names the name of the school, I want to go to this school more than I've ever wanted anything. I'm not a faker, and everything I'm saying right now, I really mean it. Please, Rabbi, please give me a chance. Please take it into consideration to accept me for the 10th grade. I know school starts in less than two weeks. But in five seconds, anything can happen. Thank you for listening to me. So between Rosh Hashanah and Kiver, she kept on talking about she can't, she can't. She said, you know, whatever other kids do in seconds takes me hours. I got to work my butt off. To, to get things done. I just can't. Uh, I can't do it anymore. And, you know, I, I gave her encouraging words to the best of my ability. And pretty much, Erwin Kipper, I, during the first Suda, she came to the table and I saw a different picture. I, I saw a girl without a skirt being somewhat that's called progressive. I didn't say a thing. It's in my house. No big deal. That's where she should be feeling most comfortable. You know, maybe she just decided to come to the Suda with pajamas. That's the way I looked at it and said, I'm not going to say anything. She basically was wearing leggings. And um, she ended up going that afternoon to my older daughter. Um, she lives in Lakewood. And um, she put on a skirt and she went there for you know, Yom Kippur. Um, to help out with the kids, and that was that. Come, and I figured, okay, you know, she put on the skirt again, so it must be it just wasn't comfortable or whatever it was. Didn't exactly know what it means. After Yom Kippur, she came back home the next day. My wife actually had a appointment with her to go to a life coach or something, which she had the next day after Yom Kippur, and she just came without a skirt, and that's the way she was going to go to the life coach, and obviously my, the first reaction was like, okay, this is not just at home. This is something new, something real. Um, but then, you know, just a few days earlier, they were always, she kept on getting dollars and back and forth and all that, you know, from the, from the school. You know, they kept on having a contest, a sneeze thing and all that. If you come with a top button closed, you get a dollar or something. And I kept on asking, so who's up and who's down? You know, are you making some good money? <laughs> um, and the school was happy. They were. They said it's amazing what she's doing. Uh, little did we know that everything we're seeing over there, which we had so much nachas out, was re not really a child not really building, but a child overheating, which all came to a crash. Avim Kippur. She didn't slip, she didn't slide, she didn't change. She just jumped off a cliff, cliff without a parachute. And that was when she said, no more school, I'm not going anywhere. And she dropped everything that she knew before, everything. And she held on to nothing. I don't want to see school. I don't want to see anything. And that was it. It happens to be that during Sukkot, one day when, um, during Sukkot, we were talking, it just happened to be a, a certain uh, person in, uh, in the community that was in jail, came out of jail at that time. I think it was, it was a rebbe or something, so it was news. So we was, were talking about that he came out of prison for Yontov or something like that, and all of a sudden things came out of her mouth. Uh, that I've never heard because she never spoke that way. She was never in, in, in I'm going to say, in 
she never talked politics, so she didn't have a, an opinion really. And all of a sudden, what came out of her mouth, it says, "What? They let him out of jail?" It says they should put all rabbis, all teachers, all principals, everybody. They all belong in jail. We started really understanding the pain that's going on underneath. So I remember she telling me, "Ta, it's okay. I'll be fine. You know." I think Bill Gates or Steve Jobs also dropped out of high school, and look what they did. He said, it's okay, it's going to be fine. I remember I made a little bit of a interesting comment, which I was, you know, later on someone told me that my, how damaging my comment was, and it was a very positive comment. I said, yeah, it's true, you know, not everybody needs to go through college and all that, but I think they dropped out of college, not really out of high school. I felt maybe if I'll tell her a little bit, I'll encourage her. When someone educated me later and saying there's, there was one lifeline that she held on to, that she can become a Steve Jobs, you know, in many different ways, right? Even dropping out of high school. And you basically told her that that's not the case. So I realized at that moment how little we all know, not being, to a degree, educated, um, of what to say and what not to say, you know, because we just work with instinct and encouragement by saying, you know, hold on a little bit longer is the right thing to do. So we thought. So what happened to Malki? So at that point on, she was not in the school. She wasn't in the school for a while. Um, everything changed. Her whole lifestyle changed. And it became, we saw a complete, it, it, it was a very different person. Um, she just eventually she, what? she stopped she stopped believing in everything in, in the system. Uh, uh, she was believing in everything. There was a girl, a very close friend of hers. She saw she she just saw how much the system had betrayed her. Yeah, she, there was a girl actually that at that time um, um, told her a very close friend was like telling her, Malki, don't worry, Hashem loves you. I'm saying, don't tell me that. I don't believe there is one. It's impossible. Because what kind of a sham is there? That if, why me? It was very. It was a lot of anger. Eventually, that subsided, and she actually she started turning all that around. And um, Amuna became her number one thing. She was saying, because she was angry, she was, angry. she was really angry at Hashem, but eventually she like submitted to it, um, she was like, everything that, she used to chastise me, every time I was saying things like, uh, this happened or that happened, she kept on saying, Ta, nothing happened, everything is from Hashem, she said, a leaf doesn't fall off a tree without him, so if that's the case, there's nothing happened, she said, I don't know why me, I don't know why this, I don't know why that, but everything comes from Hashem. You know, later on, those things became, she became a little bit softer. She she started keep on you know, saying, she did Facebook posts and this and that. I You know, I trust in God's plans for me. I, everything was God, 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 God. Um, what happened? You know, so she, she once posted not long ago, maybe I think a year ago, she said, she post on Facebook, she wrote, God has only three answers. Yes, not right now, or I have something better planned for you, Malki, with a little smiley. Eventually, and then eventually she went to um, an alternative school for, you know, for girls that don't have schools, the girls that look a little different, behave a little different, dress a little different, run by some very wonderful people. Um, she, she went to that school and um, she did, I'm going to say wonderful, relatively speaking. I mean, all within her abilities and inabilities. Um, she started dabbling in substances I mean, we had the discussion one time about using drugs and stuff, and I, I asked her to please explain to me, like, why, why I was talking about the danger of using drugs. 
I said, like, what does it do for you? I really want to take interest in in, in everything she does and everything she feels as much as possible. So one night we had a discussion. It was like 2, 3 in the morning. That, that was my daily schedule because that's when we were able to really schmooze. And um, so I was asking her, what does, why, why the drugs? What does it do? And she was explaining to me, it numbs me. It takes me away from my feelings. And I asked her, I said, do you, you know how dangerous it is? I mean, this is not pharmaceutical grade. This is, um, you never know what you're buying. You never know what you're getting. And um, she says, I know. And I know that I'm playing with fire every day. But that's not the issue. The issue is that doing the drugs allows me to live because without it, it makes me numb. And without it, all I do is think and think and think and think and think. And it creates a lot of pain. And I responded to her that I'm saying, oh, Malky, I, I really feel your pain. And I think I even said it in this particular voice. And she lashed out at me. She said, no, Todd, don't you ever, ever say that to me. You don't know what it feels like. You cannot feel my pain. And I was trying to defend myself, saying, yeah, of course I do. I, I feel you. My daughter said, no, 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 Tom. I said, you do not know what it feels like being stupid every single day of your life. You can never feel that pain. That's what I feel. And I said, you always had these friends, and you always, and, and that's why I don't have friends. And she said, you always had these friends. I mean, you were the most popular girl in the, in the whole family, in the whole school, and all that. She says, that and, and you were always so happy. She says, I do not remember one single happy day in my life. You saw me being happy. You saw me smiling. You saw me going to friends and calling friends. And all that was a lot, a lot, a lot of work for me. It was a facade. It was a show. It was trying to overcome my inside feeling. And that is all I remember from day one. I don't remember anything else. Because every day I felt stupid. And she gave me a whole list of things that I'm allowed to tell her. I can feel for her. I can understand her. I can this and I can that. She says, but don't you ever tell me you feel my pain. Life is pretty good for you. You go, you come, you achieve, you're successful. But my life is very different. And going back into the talk of drugs, and we were going back to it, I was saying that what, you know, what has shown, something could really happen. Says, I understand and believe you me, I don't have a death wish. I promise you, I don't have a death, death wish. But if God forbid something happens, what? What am I really losing? What kind of a life? Not much there. I'm sorry. It's a little hard for me to talk. And then she went. Then she went clean. She was working very hard. She made her own program, she went clean, she went to meetings, and she really worked on trying to be clean, and she did it for six, seven, eight months, I don't remember exactly the time, and then she relapsed, and that was her own program, and I'm not exactly sure what she was doing about those days, what kind of drugs, but um, she was very proud of herself that she actually is working on recovery, then she relapsed, and she, it was like on and off and on and off until one day she said, Ta, I got to go to a rehab. So I said, I asked her if she's sure about it. And I said, you know, rehab is not home. They're going to tell you when to wake up. They're going to tell you when to go to sleep. They're going to tell you when to eat, when to stop eating. They're, they're going to tell you, and, and I want you to know the, the commitment you're making, if you're ready for that commitment. And she said, and I said, you went, want, you already stopped doing drugs for yourself once and you did the program very nicely 
And she says, this time I do not feel I can do it myself. I said, great, no problem, your choice. I'm gonna, I don't know anything about rehabs. I'll try to find you a person that can actually listen to you and guide you, somebody that understands these kind of things. And I actually reached out to someone, the person came over and they had a long discussion talking about um, everything in rehab and they together they chose a particular place in California. There were three things that Malky was doing at that time. She kept 100% kosher. She, for some reason or another, while she doesn't, wasn't doing much of other things, she took it upon herself to light to light Shabbos candles. And she lit Shabbos candles every Friday night. But that was going on for a while. You know, Chabad, that's what they do. That's not where I come from. But that was her own doing. And she was fasting. You know, Kipper, that was her, her thing. That was the few things that she really held on to. So she went to rehab, and one of the reasons she went to a particular rehab is because she was doing these kind of things, and it's Jewish-owned, and then there's always she was told that they're sensitive to these kind of things, and they even have a kosher kitchen for the kids that want to do kosher, and that was appealing. Um, so she went there. I, only, only after she went, I. I I, and I went there, I thought it's not really the kosher kitchen, it's not that much of a kosher, I mean, it's a kosher kitchen, but it's like uh, some makeshift thing in the garage, and there's not really a whole, a whole lot of kosher food, you know, the, the other kids get a gourmet, fully gourmet meal done by a chef on a daily basis, and she was getting food in the tray, um, so it was a little bit hard, and when we went, the first week we went to visit her, because we, we were in California like every week, every second week. And she, the first week of visit, she, she says, Ty, you want to see the kosher kitchen? <laughs> and she says, so this is the kosher kitchen. That's the kosher fridge. It says kosher on it. And this is the kosher microwave and the kosher this and the kosher that. And she takes out a foam foam container from the thing. She says, you want to see my lunch? Here it is, <laughs> a, two slices of salami in a roll. <laughs> and, and I'm looking in the rest of the place and I see this gourmet meal. And I'm thinking, how is this girl going to survive on kosher? And this this is a place run by... Jews, owned by Jews. Anyway, I said, and she said, you know what? Let me go, let, let's buy stuff and I'll cook myself. That's what she said. She was 17. And uh, we went to the kosher uh, place and we bought a bunch of, uh, we filled up the whole freezer with, with uh, um, chicken drumsticks and, and um, burger patties, anything that's easy, easy to, easy to cook, uh, very quick. We filled up the whole freezer, and that's what she was doing day after day. She was cooking herself to to keep kosher. I was telling that place, um, she lights ca- candles. She, they, those are the things that she holds on to. She's holding on to kosher. She's holding on to candles. And you keep her. Please make sure that you provide it, because what you don't want is what I don't want. It's for her to find that she failed in one more thing in her life. Obviously, she's holding on to it. At this moment in time. I do not think that she needs to do anything. Um, with her current condition, she's part her from everything. However, if that's what you hold on, hold on to, it is important that she should be able to hold on to it because her whole life, the way she sees it, is failure, and she doesn't need to fail more. And so they gave me a little bit of an argument. She needs to ask, and she needs to this, and because rehabs are somewhat like boot camp or something to try and I said fine this is a thousand things that this girl needs to do and you'll argue with everything can you please not argue about these three things um, because allowing her and encouraging her to do what she feels good about is going to make your argument and everything else that much simpler easier to achieve um, so they I said give her provider candles I said um, oh she should ask I said please provide her candles so she doesn't have to ask she will not ask she will be embarrassed to ask that's what's going to be so they provided her four candles she had two for one Shabbos she had two for the second Shabbos and 
Sunday, but after I spoke after the third Shabbos, she told me, Ta, they didn't give me candles. That was the end of the candles. She cooked her own food for six weeks. Every day, while everybody was being prepared meals, she cooked her own food. After six weeks, she became tired. She started giving the guys to cook her her kosher meat to cook in the knife in the pots. Eventually, you know, the whole thing fell fell apart. And on. So for the last so many years, I was thinking I got to do an I I I got I got I got to do a rehab. I got to do the right rehab. It's not about making somebody religious or forcing somebody religious, but give a kid a choice, a real choice. Have two cooks, go pay for this and go pay for that. So they can actually stay strong in whatever they feel like and whatever makes them feel good. So they can actually build, build on it. So there's a foundation so they can continue building. Um, but certain things are out of my league. And I don't know, I didn't think I can actually pull it off. I'd spoken to people. There were even people that wanted to put in money and volunteer. It just never materialized because in the last six years, my wife and I and the whole family, really, we were, we were in, in a triage mode. We were trying to save this kid and help her build it and build herself. It was a little difficult to do anything else besides concentrating on that. So once she went to rehab, she was doing very well. She was clean for 13, 14 months. She didn't even want to go out. She didn't want to leave. She was afraid to leave. Um, she had a very difficult time. She didn't want to come back to Brooklyn. She was afraid. We we offered her even, you know, we will go somewhere else. But she didn't want That was out of the question. She found that very unrealistic. And reality was unrealistic for us too, because we have other kids too, and they're attending school, and we can't uproot. It's very difficult to uproot, traumatizing other kids. Um, he said it's fine. I don't have to come to Brooklyn, and not at this time. When I'll be strong enough, I'll come back. And um, so, that, you know, I don't need the Brooklyn stairs. I don't need the Brooklyn judgment. Judgment. I don't need this. I don't need that. Um, so after 13 months of being clean, she went from a one program to a next program, and then she relapsed. There were some very difficult times during that relapse. And then she went clean again. And um, and now she was clean for the last nine or ten months, doing extremely well with a plan of coming back, to, finally coming back to Brooklyn, being close to family, being close to home, rebuilding, and um, she got into different things, being in rehab. She got into art, and I, we never saw that quality in her. We never saw it. Uh, she started drawing pictures, and in the same time, while it's amazing, her, the first time she put pen to paper, she drew the most beautiful pictures from a, from a uh, talent perspective. But in the same time, the pictures were horrific, because what she did is she basically uh, expressed her feelings through drawings. I know some of it has been going around on the internet, or her drawings, and um, they actually speak volumes. They speak for themselves. No need to explain them. But she was going to rebuild. She was going to come back to Brooklyn, and she did. And uh, a week she came a week before she passed away is when she came back to Brooklyn. Final departure from California. Even though she had a, like a, I'm going to call it a little relapse just before she came home, which was um, just before Shavuos. We were in Shavuos, uh, for Shavuos we were in California. Um, she got back on the wagon, so to speak. She came home. Everything was nice and dandy. Um, we spent time to get together Thursday. By day, she baked challahs with my wife. She took challahs, she made a bracha. And then whatever happened, for one reason or another, I knew she's in a slump. I knew she's down because about a week earlier, um, 
she FaceTimed me and uh, and she started crying. She was talking again about oh, everybody around me are overachievers and I'm an underachiever. And I told her, look at your art, look at your photography. Everybody around you doesn't have a clue how to even look at it. How to even? And I know because I'm an artist. So I said, I know what, what you're doing. And she says, Ta, you're my father. You'll tell me anything to make me feel good. But that's not the case. And at that day, she was crying. She says, it's four in the afternoon. I didn't even brush my teeth yet. Because that's me. I couldn't get out of bed this morning feeling so down. I just couldn't get out of bed. It's four in the afternoon. I still didn't brush my teeth. So I knew she's not in a good state, but she was relatively okay compared to other times earlier. So I made sure when she came home, I made sure to have a Narcan kit in the house just in case. And that Thursday night after Shebeik Chalas, through Mamish, a miracle because of a package, it's a long story, that came and I saw it by the door, so I wanted to go up to the room to give it to her. And I found her um, in a terrible state, and I quickly, and she was basically OD'd, and I quickly grabbed the the, the kit and administered... um, the Narcan and Baruch Hashem at that time she within a few minutes she came back as if nothing had happened um, actually that's all I was here within a minute and they started seeing that the pulse is coming back and breathing is coming back and um, at that day I was actually looking to find a doctor because she said you know I need someone to prescribe me with Suboxone I need someone to prescribe it right now so I don't go there again. I was looking all over the place, reaching out everywhere to find a, a psychiatrist or somebody that licensed to, to prescribe it. We we couldn't find anybody. We finally got an appointment for Monday. And she was very, very nervous about it. Um, she was, And it was five minutes before Shabbos. She asked, Ta, what's going on with the Suboxone? I said, I'm still trying. She said, it's not going to happen because it's right before Shabbos. None of your friends are going to pick up the phones or do anything right now. I said, don't worry, there's people still working on it. And then Friday night, and uh, eventually she went to her room, and then a friend came, um, a close friend of hers, and spent with her um, all throughout Friday night until 5 o'clock in the afternoon um, was here. Um, She didn't feel that well because she was more in a... um, uh, withdrawal state because of the Narcan. She had the shivers and she just wasn't feeling that well. And she, uh, so she wanted to stay in bed. And um, but the friend joined us at the meal. And the friend left at five o'clock. Um, I went to my shear in the afternoon, which was a quarter to seven. I didn't even know the friend is not here. I decided not to disturb her, knowing she has a friend here. So uh, I went to my shear, but. I found out um, later because about I went about a quarter to seven. I went to shul and about seven fifteen or seven twenty, whenever it was, I was called or seven thirty. It was from shul that um, she's not responsive, and I came running home. So I got the call at the same time. I tried to do the same thing again, but I when the moment I walked into the room, I saw this is different than what I saw on Thursday. But she walked out of the house at roughly six o'clock. She came back six thirty, whatever, just to, within a minute or two after I left the shul. To shul, she spent time with my wife for about a half an hour. They were sitting and talking, and she was together chatting until she when she left. And she went up to her room. My wife went up to her room twenty minutes later or so, just to say goodbye because she was going to go to spend some time with a neighbor. Um, and when she saw her in that state. And this time around, we were not able to bring her back. And that's the end. What would you say to the principal who threw her out of school? If she was listening, what would you say? Or if he or she was listening, what would you say? The only thing I can say today, the only thing I could say, you know, I, I, I there, there are times that I, today, these days, by nature, I'm not an angry person, but there are times during the day that I have that I have a lot of anger. Other times, a lot of pain, or I think anger with pain. 
sadness. There's, you know, I have all different kind of feelings going through my mind, my body, my heart. And I tell you honestly that whenever I'm in a in a, in, a, in a place of anger, I really don't like to talk to people. Simply because whatever I would say, whatever that I could say, I really don't want it to come from that place because I don't think that anything coming from that place will actually bring any positive results. It goes, it becomes more of a screaming, yelling, argument match. Everybody tries to be right. I don't want to be right. I don't care to be right. If I can, I would like to be able to make a difference. What I would say to the principal at a state when I'm not angry and I'm not right now, this is a hindsight to teach you to better educate yourself. A whole lot of other kids going through your hands. He says, Megalgons chisar yedazak evichar v'adaychayev. Read those words. Do whatever you can for you not to be the chayev. That's my only message I have. But what would you say to the other principals of so many schools who send kids home for non-payment and maybe could keep kids home for months? I've seen that, unfortunately. I saw it in Lakewood too many times. Or to principals who throw kids out of school, maybe they dressed the wrong way, maybe they did. What would you say to those principals? I really, I'll tell you, I really think it's not an issue. I I, I very much believe in Claudius' role. I said, Mikam Chesor, it's so true. When we see issues that we can identify, when we identify with issues and we relate to those issues, there is no nation, there are, there's no people that respond to a crisis like we do. Bar none, the world responds to an earthquake in Haiti and they start feeding people. They don't have what to eat all year round because that's the only, that's the way they, 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 that's the only way they respond. We feed people all year round. We make uh, programs of tikkunas chasanas. So people can afford to marry off kids. We have moisters that charge so little they can barely survive because can I know how that we have large families and we are a, a a a people of chesed. That's who we are. So inherently, I truly believe that everybody means well. I just think that people are terribly misguided. And what I would tell people, what I would tell principals, and I mostly I would tell parents, really, is you don't have to wait for a crisis to go learn something you might not know. I would especially tell it to principals and mechanchem and mechanchos to never think that they were born to be mechanchem and mechanchos, that it's in their DNA. There is a lot more to learn of how to deal with kids that are not running on autopilot. Kids that need extra help, kids that need guidance, kids that we need to be their GPS, those are the kids that we need to concentrate on. The rest, they're turning out to be whatever they turn out to be. As I once heard someone say, despite of what we do, what we do rather than because of what we do. We need to concentrate on the kids that are trailing behind because those are the ones that need our help. And unfortunately, we don't because there is principals, the yeshivas, schools, they they serve the masses. And masses, the masses ha- doesn't have the problem. There are the few that, that, that have the issues. And uh, the systems are built to work that way and therefore the other ones don't survive and what i have found and i've gotten to know malki's friends i have found those kids to be extremely smart extremely bright extremely intuitive all of them deep thinkers 
highly sensitive, ultra sensitive, every one of them, each and every one of them, they process and process and reprocess information. One word, one bad word, one time telling a child in second grade that they belong in the first grade, they, they never, ever get over it, ever. It makes them feel stupid for the rest of their life. If Hashem gave that person a particular level of a, a, a resi- level of resilience, they can withstand that. They will remember it, but they will overcome. But for those that don't have that immune system and they, their, their immune system is not that great, those fall apart. Those are the kids we lose. And some of them get to a point where they just can't climb out of it. I'm going to add something to that. What would I tell principals in schools? Do some introspection. Try to wipe your slate clean from everything you know, from everything you thought you know, from everything you believe you know. Do introspection and find out maybe there's a whole lot of things that you don't. Because the moment you'll start searching, you got the Mitsusa, you will find you will find a better way how to do things. Rabbi Klein, thank you very much for sharing this. And I hope that we have, you know, there'll be tens of thousands of people listening to this. And I hope that this chus, maybe you will save another child's life. Maybe you will, some educator, some parent will be wiser and there will be one less broken child. And may that chus be for the memory of your beautiful daughter, Zechariah Lebracha. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.